2014 has not been a good year for the reputation of California lawmakers. Convictions for perjury and indictments for fraud, bribery, money laundering, and gun running. Some say these instances are just the personal failings of a few bad apples. Others argue that these are just the latest manifestations of the unseemly, corrupting, and ever-expanding influence of money in politics. What are the allegations, and what is the likely political fallout? We'll ask. Laurel Rosenhall, a reporter from the Sacramento Bee who's been covering these stories. John Myers, government and political editor for KQED. And Dan Moraine, the editorial page editor of the Sacramento Bee. Capital crimes, personal failings of a few, or a culture of corruption? Additional funding for the Matty Report made possible by a grant from Paramount Agricultural Companies, growing healthy food for you and your family. From the California Channel at the State Capitol, Valley PBS, and the Maddie Institute, it's the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. Welcome. We're in Sacramento at the State Capitol uh, that's rocking with a series of ethical scandals relating to three state senators. And our first guest is Laurel Rosenthal, a reporter for the Sacramento Bee who's been covering these stories. Welcome to the Maddie Report. Thank you. Um, so it might be helpful to kind of walk our audience through what's been going on here in Sacramento. Let's start with the, the first case where we've already got a conviction of sorts, I guess you'd say, uh, the case of Senator uh, Rod Wright. What happened there? Yeah, so um, a Los Angeles jury in January found Rod Wright guilty of eight felonies, essentially for lying about where he lives. And... Um, you know, the state law requires that legislative candidates live in the districts that they want to represent. And believe it or not, whether you live in your district is apparently a more complicated question than you might think. Um, a lot of politicians move around. Frequently, they have a home in Sacramento and a home in their home district. District lines get redrawn. They might take a new place so that they can run in a politically more favorable district. And in the case of Rod Wright, uh, the jury found that he did not live in the home in Inglewood that he claimed as his official residence, a home that he had owned for many years, but that he instead lived a few miles away in a tonier part of Los Angeles called Baldwin Hills um, in another home that he owned. And he maintained all along that he owned three homes, lived in three places, but met the legal criteria to run for his district. His might be the, the, the least scandalous of the three cases. Let's go on to the second case. The second case deals with Senator Ron Calderon. What happened there? Right. So that one is kind of a, uh, uh, well, that one is a corruption case. And Ron Calderon was indicted on 24 counts, including corruption and money laundering. Uh, his case involves his brother and also a former hospital executive named Michael Drobot, who's also an enormous political donor um, to the Democratic Party and Democratic politicians. And essentially, there's two pieces to the Ron Calderon story. One is an undercover FBI sting in which an FBI agent posed as a movie studio owner in Los Angeles and was offering Calderon bribes to carry a bill that would give a tax break to small film to studios. The other piece of it has to do with this uh, hospital executive, Michael Drobot, who is in a plea deal cooperating with the prosecutors and admitted paying bribes to Ron Calderon in order to perpetuate essentially an insurance scam that has to do with a workers' compensation insurance and a spinal procedure, a spinal surgery. Overcharging and things of that nature. Being able to kind of double charge for a certain kind of surgery that was a lucrative form of business for him. Okay, then we come to the interesting case of Senator Yilin Lee. What is he accused of? Leland Yi is also a, a corruption case, but it's a separate one. He's the senator from San Francisco, and that um, was an, FBI, an enormous FBI sting that appears to have begun as an organized crime investigation, looking at a group in Chinatown that um, they thought you know, was possibly a gang. So he wasn't the target initially. Not initially. It was a five-year investigation by the FBI, and what it, it looks like it grew from, be, from being a, a gang investigation outwards to incorporating this political corruption piece. And eventually, um, the agents, once they, th through a political consultant that both had connections to the Chinatown group and to Senator Yee, 
uh, they got to they got to Yi and they did a series of stings with FBI agents posing as various people who were seeking political favors, including a medical marijuana businessman who wanted you know some introductions in the Capitol, um, a, the Chinatown group that was seeking an official proclamation from Senator Yi. And um, there's also the gun run. And charge. then the gun piece. <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit about the gun run yeah. piece. Um, so one and of. By the way, he was a big supporter of, of gun control. Right. He had carried some gun control legislation, and the accusation that 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 federal authorities assert is that he conspired with with an undercover agent to sell weapons and and import weapons from the Philippines to help this undercover agent who was posing as kind of an East Coast mafioso who wanted to buy weapons. So it's pretty extraordinary and the charge against him is for conspiracy to traffic weapons. There are several counts of it um, and, and, also, and also for the corruption. There, there are more counts of corruption against him than gun trafficking, but that is one piece of it. So how long could he, if he is found guilty, how long could he be, he be in prison? The maximum would be over 100 years for him. Wow, that's pretty, pretty significant. Well, thank you for laying out those three stories uh, of ethical scandals here at the Capitol. I want to thank Laura Rosenthal, a reporter for the Sacramento Bee, for joining us. Up next, what's the political fallout of all of these scandals? That conversation in a moment. This is the Matty Report. Welcome back. So what's the political fallout from the recent ethics scandals that are rocking the state capitol? We're fortunate to be joined by two of the capitol's most respected political observers, John Myers, with, uh, who's the politi politics and government editor with KQED. Welcome back to the Matter Report. Thank you. And Dan Moraine, who's the editorial page editor with the Sacramento Bee. Welcome back to the Matter Report, Dan. Happy to be here. So um, we've got all three senators uh, being suspended with pay. Uh, critics charge it's too little too late. Uh, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, you, you, you get the sense at some point that, that uh, these actions taken by the Senate leadership were like a tourniquet on a bleeding wound. Um, you know, I mean, trying desperately to, to change the, the narrative, change the discussion, change the topic. Um, clearly, you saw this package of, um, of bills that uh, Senate Leader Steinberg and others are trying to push about ethics reforms and money and all of these things, all as a response to it. But, but you, you wonder what the long-term implications here, and I don't know whether that just means electorally in November, and I suspect it's beyond that, or, or what the long-term ramifications are about the way we do business here. You know, as Dan and I were, were, were talking about, I mean, it goes to the heart of how the Capitol does business uh, and what the public thinks people here in office do. And just because we haven't seen any scandals for, what, 20-some years doesn't mean that everything is rosy, right? I mean, yeah, clearly it, three, uh, two, two in particular yeah, uh, cases. Certainly doesn't help the reputation of the legislature. So what do you think, Dan? Uh, was it the right thing to do in terms of suspending these three senators? Well, I don't think that the, the Senate Democrats had any choice but to suspend them. The question is, why haven't they expelled them? I mean, the, it, is, it is clearly within their purview um, to, to decide who can sit in their house, and they could expel them. Um, they don't want to expel Rod Wright because they like him. He's a likable guy. I, I think most people would agree that Ron Calderon was not the most popular uh, uh, man on campus. Neither was Leland Yee. Um, so I think if Rod Wright were not part of the equation, it would be a little different, and they would move to expel. So it's kind of it's kind of personal, maybe there. And, and uh, you know, and it's also personal. too, if you if yeah. you if they had done it early, right. if they had done the expulsion early and mm -hmm. gotten in front of the story, that'd been one thing. But now, uh, you know, I'm sure there are Democrats who believe, you know, there's this you know cacophony of noise about expulsion and everything else, and then we'll look like we're just reacting to that, and we keep the story going, even though the story keeps going anyway. So it's <laughs> it's a tough one. So is this emblematic of of what? the culture of the capital, or is this just a few bad apples? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, we've been, we've been writing, John's been broadcasting about, about the, the culture in Sacramento for, for a lot of years. Um, you know, the end of session fundraisers, they're, they're voting on a thousand bills in the last, last couple of days of the session, and they're holding 
numerous fundraisers. And is that the, the fundraising season? That well, that is. is one of the fundraising seasons. I mean, that's the big fundraising season. It'll Bill introduction as well. It'll yeah. certainly be a big fundraising season this year because it's election year. Um, but it's so unseemly where you you vote on a bill in the morning and you go across the street uh, to to one of the bars or coffee houses and raise and, and and collect your checks. I mean, it's it's unseemly. Now that's not illegal, <laughs> but it's part of the culture, and I think that that's that's you know this is this is the fallout of that. Cultural or personal? I I I, I or both. Well, both, both. I mean, clearly, if you look at the cases, and you know, we have to be fair here. We have to look. We have we have to put the Rod Wright case in a different category than the Ron Calder and the Leland Yee case. The Rod Wright case is about where he lived, mm -hmm. and did he tell the truth about where he lived under state law that you have to live in the district? But he's Not, been convicted, though. Uh, well, the jury has found him guilty in yeah, the parsing of the words in the Capitol, but the judge, uh, we're, we're waiting, and that may happen by the time some of the viewers see this. But the Wright case goes to kind of the way you run for office and the rules about that. Calderon and Yee go to the heart, I think, of allegations of corruption and bribes and the way you do legislative business. But, but I, I think Dan raises a great point is that so many years you've heard people say, should we change the system of when we raise money, how we raise money, what those relationships are. There has been massive resistance or, or basically um, uh, just not paying attention inertia. at all, inertia, inside the Capitol. And now it's really, I think, very hard for them to completely ignore it. And as I said, the leadership in the Senate has a package of bills, whether you like them or don't like them, that are a complete, um, uh, completely uh, sparked by what's going on. They didn't just decide to wake up one morning and say, let's tackle you know, government reform under the Capitol. They saw the headlines and they knew what they had to do. You know, I want to ask you quickly uh, before we end this segment, and that is about lobbyists. You know, it's not just legislators, it's lobbyists. Uh, recently, one of them was fined, record fine, $133,000 for hosting fundraisers that exceeded uh, the amount allowed by law. So what about the third house? Um, should lobbyists be more regulated? Well, I think lobbyists are pretty heavily regulated. I think one thing that, that uh, people might want to think about is, is um, registering and requiring f uh, professional fundraisers to go through some sort of ethics training and, and registration. Um, you know, I do think lobbyists are heavily regulated, but I, you know, back to a point that John was making that, that Rod Wright is different from Calderon and Leland Yee, um, it, it all gets to the, to the question of, of dancing at the, at the line or going over the line. I mean, you know, Rod Wright did something that many legislators have done, which is to say they live one place, but they don't. They don't live in their district. They live over the border because it's more convenient. It's a nicer part of town. I mean, whatever the argument is. But, but it's, all, it's all this sort of, sort of tri um, situational ethics. Yeah, right more on the line. Well, we're, up next, we're going to talk about some of the reforms being proposed to respond to these scandals. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. We're talking with Dan Moraine from the Sacramento Bee and John Myers from KQED. So, uh, Dan, uh, not surprisingly, there are lots of ethics reforms uh, being considered. Uh, one of them is uh, peak session fundraising, which you were talking about in the earlier segment. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it, I think it gets, it, it, it might have some impact around the edges. I, I'm not sure that it's really going to change the culture. What well, do you think, John? I, I, you know, it's, it's certainly been talked about a very long time. I mean, you know, it's, it's the fashionable thing to talk about now. You have a candidate for Secretary of State talking about it. You have it inside the building. Arnold Schwarzenegger talked about it in his reform agenda in the 2003 recall campaign, and it went absolutely nowhere. Um, I, I think Dan raised a good point in the last segment, which there's this perception, if nothing else, of walking across the street, taking a vote, taking money. But you know there there are other there are other issues that are out there and and just really quickly to roll back to one we talked about in the last conversation about lobbying I think Dan's right the lobbying is well regulated except when you talk about what is lobbying people who lobby who are not registered Good lobbyists point. I did a piece this past year on shadow lobbying on the vast numbers of people it seems like who walk up to the line of having to register as lobbying but they do consulting they do something else can you give me an example of what you're talking about um, you're a paid uh, consultant where you come in and you tell a, a big company you know, here's how I think you should handle the capital. Isn't that lobbying in a way? Or then you make a subsequent phone call 
to your former boss who's in the state legislature and say, you know, gosh, you know, my client thinks X. Now, is that lobbying? I think the public would see that as lobbying, but there's a, there's a legal definition there. And I do think the bottom line, there's room for change here, but is it change on the margins or is it you know, systemic change, and I think Dan's point is that it's margins. Well, we, you know, we've got a state agency, the Fair Political Practices Commission. What about beefing that thing up? Um, I, I don't know that anybody thinks it's a bad idea, though I think if you roll back several years, they had budget problems that no one would give them money because they didn't want to be watched. Um, but I think it may go beyond that. I mean, you know, if you, if you look at how the FPPC came into effect, it was the Political Reform Act of 1974. The times that that big change in the, the the rules would seem have happened in California are when the voters have gone to the ballot box, not the legislature enacting its own uh, changes to the system. Fair, are you fair to say? I, well, I think that's true. I think that 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 as the Supreme Court is headed down the path mm -hmm. of of lifting campaign finance regulation, the U.S. Supreme Court, I think what really is gonna is is going to be left is disclosure. And so if there could be immediate disclosure, greater disclosure of, 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 of money that gets spent, of lobbying activity, at least the public could be informed. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're, we're headed down this path where, where we're gonna have a lot more money in the, in the system. At least it, it ought to be disclosed. Um, what about uh, the sunshine? I, I know the press always is concerned about, uh, they say sunshine's the best disinfectant. Um, so should there be uh, increased transparency? Yes, I think that that's that's you know that that is the most important thing. But you know, I mean, what is transparency? The 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 uh, Lee Lin Yi was a, was a huge big champion of transparency. You know, <laughs> I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> it's just, well, it's but and and then stunning, really. and then how do you solve uh, things that go beyond the transparency? So great, you have full disclosure. Mm -hmm. You know within 24 hours that Senator Jones gets a um, $4,000 contribution for the Committee for Good Government. Well, who's the Committee for Good right, Government? Right, and on and on right, it goes. Right. I think, I, I think th there's no perfect system. Right. But Dan raises a great point. If, if, if there is more information that people can make their own value judgments with, it would seem to be better than the system right. we have had in the past, which is a lot less of that. Right. One of the things that Leland Yee disclosed was a, was a Coke and a straw for a dollar eighty nine from the co now he disclosed that he did not disclose gun running, but so. all depends. Yeah, I guess yeah. it all depends. Well, what about legislators um, kind of monitoring their own behavior? Some people say, well, you know, that's the fox guarding the hen house, and uh, the chair of the Senate Ethics Co Commission is saying, our committee is saying, maybe we need an ethics ombudsman, someone outside uh, investigating wrongdoing. What do you what do you think about that? Uh, you know, I guess it all would depend. I mean, I think, that not that kind of the function of the Fair Political Practices Commission? Um, you know, if we, had a, if we had a different Secretary of State, a stronger Secretary of State, it could be a Secretary of State who is a more aggressive uh, watchdog of... of uh, isn't that what Leland Yee was running for? He yeah. was. Yes. And, and, if you, and if you want to be someone who crusades about uh, cleaning up government, and maybe you want to run for office yourself, what would you like to be? The person in charge of an ethics commission. I mean, nobody knows better crusading, as I said, the Political Reform Act than Jerry Brown. That's how he became governor in 1974 in part, running that campaign. Uh, anybody would want to be in charge of that. But again, does the public believe that is someone who's really watching it? Or is it just another person in the system patting everybody on the back? Is this a tipping point for public financing of elections? Boy, that... That would be a bold no. prediction that you won't. Yeah, you won't. <laughs> no. You won't have me make it. It, it, it will. It, we will have that discussion again. I, I, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, with what's going on in Washington and everywhere else, I mean, that would be a really tough one. It, it, we may get over 10 percent support for public financing. We may not. <laughs> okay. The answer then, I guess, is no. Well, up next, what are the short and long-term implications for these scandals? That conversation in a moment. This is the Matter Report. Welcome back. We're talking with John Myers from KQED and Dan Moraine from the Sacramento Bee. So, Dan, what do you think the political fallout in the current, legislati uh, current legislative session is going to be? You know, things like that need a two-thirds majority, like a change in the water bond or change in the rainy day fund. And change in the fair political, the, the California Political Reform Act also takes a two-thirds vote. Mm -hmm. it, they're not going to get it. I mean, they, they, uh, unless 
Um, Any of I, those? The water bond? The rainy day well, fund? Well, they might get a water bond. They might get a water bond. But, but you know, it's, it's going to be very hard to get a two-thirds majority. But it would have been hard to get a two-thirds majority with, with Calderon and Yee in the legislature anyway because they they often went off on their own. So this is this is a real past is prologue thing. I mean, think how we used to have to craft budgets in California and the side deals that had to be made. And the last water bond, which was 2009, 2010, which became, as you call sometimes around the Capitol, the Christmas tree bill, where everybody inserted their own little ornament on the bill, you know, to get the two thirds. That's the kind of uh, environment that you're back in now if you want to deal budget reform, water, or these other things. You've got to cut a lot of political deals. You know, Republicans are back at the table, I guess, um, on some of this. So we have uh, Senate pro tem Steinberg's legislative agenda. One of them is universal pre-K. Um, what's gonna, Is that DOA? Well, it depends on how it's crafted, right? I mean, if it's crafted as a simple majority vote as part of the budget, as part of spending, that's a whole different deal. It's 21 votes in the Senate. It's 41 in the Assembly. They're still within that. They don't have a problem with that. Their problem is with the governor on that issue. But I think maybe to your point, the, the larger point, though, Mark, is does it derail the, the perception of what's going on, the ability to focus on issues? I mean, Steinberg and others just recently tried to roll back out the momentum for the universal pre-K thing. But the headlines for weeks now have been scandal and black clouds, and so they're trying to change the, you know, the topic, I think. What do you think about Steinberg's uh, legislative agenda? Um, well, as it relates to uh, pre-K, that's a huge Democratic priority nationwide. It's, a, it's in many different states, and it's a, it's a priority of, of the president's as well. So, so I think if, if the governor can see, if Governor Brown can see a path to get federal money to help with that, then I think it's more likely than, than, than it is a, than a, if it is purely a state-funded project. Let's talk about the upcoming elections. What impact, if any, do you think these scandals are going to have in the upcoming elections? Well, I, the Democrats clearly are going to hold on to the to the legislature, and 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 I there's there's maybe one, one conceivably two, um, statewide races that a Republican can win, but it's a Democratic state. Do you want to care to name those two races? Well, I mean, I think I bet the, I can I, name the I, one he's going to name. I too. think the controller is mm -hmm. is one where where a Republican could win. Fre Fresno Mayor Swearingen could win. Um, that's a, that's a, that's an office that that Republicans are, you know, perhaps better equipped to 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 win than any other statewide, um, and then conceivably Secretary of State, but I don't really think so. But I think to your point about uh, impact, if you look at the legislature, Dan's right. I mean, you know, the Democrats are not going to lose control of either house. Um, the power of incumbency is 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 enormous in American politics, not just in California. So if you've got a senator or assembly member who's running for re-election and they're not part of the scandal, either uh, specifically or even hinted at, why are you going to vote against them? Usually, but there are some swing districts that you probably will see this come up. Uh, Orange County has a really hotly contested state senate race. That's an open seat. That's a split district with Democrats and Republicans. Everybody's going to be jockeying. I wouldn't be surprised to see mailers in that district talking about the scandals of Democrats in Sacramento, but those are isolated cases. Well, we've got Andy statewide. Vidic in the Valley, uh, yeah. who's a Republican in a basically Democratic district, so, so that'll be interesting. Well, let's, let's turn our attention to the Secretary of State's race, just because Ian Lee was, was in the race. He's now out of the race. Generally, a pretty low-profile race, uh, but it could be more this year. Uh, like, we, like we were talking about earlier, you could see a Republican surge there or a former Republican, now independent, Dan Schnoor, who's basing his whole campaign on, on uh, kind of the anti-politician, anti-corruption uh, angle. What do you think? I, I, I don't know that the voters will pay as much attention as we will. I mean, we're fascinated by that. But, I mean, it depends on what you make of the office, right? I mean, Secretary of State has a lot of other ministerial duties, but they're the chief elections officer in California as well. And if you're Dan Schnur, you want to make this about cleaning up Sacramento reform, money, I'm the guy that can champion it. I think some of the others do too. But, um, again, are the voters going to, like, rush to the polls because of Secretary of State? I, Is I, that going to be the big they, focus? They, they will not rush to the polls, but if... There can, you know, it's ironic, I suppose, if Schnur can raise enough money, um, he, you know, he could make this about cleaning up Sacramento. But, you know, that's, that's several million dollars. He's a long way from that. Well, that will be an interesting irony. Well, I want, yeah, to right. thank, I want to thank Dan Moraine from the Sacramento Bee and John Myers from KQED, as well as Laurel uh, Rosenhall for, from the Sacramento Bee for joining us. If you want to stay current on state and local politics, you can sign up for our free e-newsletter, The Maddie Daily, by logging onto our website at maddieinstitute.org. The views expressed in the Maddie Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the Maddie Institute, the California Channel, Casey, or Valley PBS. 
If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions shared in the Maddie Report, visit our website at valleypbs.org/maddie. This is Mark Kepler for the Maddie Report. Thanks for joining us.